The Tactical Control Center at the helicopter training facility here at Benson. There are six simulators for Chinook, Merlin and Puma, where pilots can prepare for desert operations in Afghanistan or steer conditions in the Falklands or flying in the snow on exercise in Norway before getting behind the controls for real. Recently, Chinook and Puma crews came out here to prepare for their disaster relief deployment to the Caribbean. We had a number of Chinook crews that came through and they're able to refresh themselves on shipboard operations, so the type of operations that they needed to be able to do in support of the Caribbean relief effort. So they were practicing how to uh, land on ships by day, by night, how to do underslung loads and the various emergency procedures. So they're fully up to speed on what they may need to do and they were able to re-qualify before they actually deployed on op, op room. And so that was again a key asset and facet of this uh, facility here. So I'm inside the Puma simulator here at our Benson, and one of the instructors has kindly agreed to show me how to hover. Uh, this is squadron leader Ian Paul. Um, Ian, thank you very much That's right. for giving me a go. So how do, how do we do this? What do so, I do? First of all, the aircraft's hovering itself at the moment. Yes. We've got quite an advanced autopilot. So what I'll do is I'll take that out in a minute. And what I'll ask you to do, but if you raise the lever initially, the aircraft should climb, and then you lower again, it will descend again. Okay. okay, so we're sitting at about 70 feet at the moment. So we normally sort of hover about 15 feet or so, so you can probably just afford to keep the aircraft going a little bit down further, and that'll make it a bit easier as we go down there. But for a first effort, that's, that's really good. I've seen far worse than that, oh, to be honest. That's good to know. <laughs> um, but people do say that this simulator training compares well to, to live fire. Yeah, there's certain things that you can do in the simulators which are absolutely excellent. So practicing the emergencies, which would be too dangerous to do for real, yeah. or instrument flying in where we're practicing flying clouds and stuff. That's really good because again, we can go anywhere and set it up in a variety um, of different scenarios. Some things, the more um, more advanced handling, it's a good introductory tool which you can then build on when you get into the aircraft itself because it's slightly different, although it's slightly different flying for real. But it'd be invaluable, and I think. The training we can deliver would be far, far worse if we didn't have tools like that available to us, to be honest, because it's just a safe learning environment that you can build, build on as people go through their, their courses. And the MOD want to utilise that realism even more over the next few years. Currently, around 25% of training is done in a simulator, but the department want this to double by 2020. We have an aim, uh, a stated aim from, uh, uh, from the Air Force, of moving towards a 50-50 balance by the year 2020. So that's moving towards 50% simulator and 50% live flying um, by the time we get to the year 2020. Increasing simulation means big savings. At around £1,200, the cost of training in a simulator is a tenth of the cost of training in the air, which can cost up to £15,000 an hour. Beyond 2020, there are plans to reduce live flying even further, down to as little as 25% of a pilot's training, although the MOD insists there will always be a need for some live training.